All right, so uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we are here on World Water Day on March 22nd, 2023, and we're here at the Museum of Ontario Archaeology. And joining us today is Kimberly Muck. Uh, she's an adjunct professor from Brock University, and she's going to talk to us about uh, uh, her work uh, with uh, re-engaging Niagara's maritime cultural landscapes. So um, I will hand it over to you, Dr. Monk. All right, well, thank you, Heather, and to Leanne and the Museum of Ontario Archaeology for inviting me to talk about our continuing work at the Shukuna Shipyard. Um, you know, this the opportunity to give this talk um, is quite... Uh, well, it's it's a it's fond it's a very fond uh, connection for me. Um, the museum and Western University was where I actually began my archaeological journey. So it's, you know, it's particularly welcome to share the results about a project that I began researching over 25 years ago as a first year undergraduate student. The research excavations at the Shakuna Shipyard in downtown St. Catharines have revealed the later industrial history of this once thriving port town. The city rose to prominence due to the route of the first and second Welland Canal, um, which shaped the physical and socioeconomic landscape across the Niagara region. The shipyard was the largest on the Canadian Great Lakes. Constructing sail and steam vessels, uh, certainly um, from 1827 until 1891. Since, since in 2019, a team of academics, field school students and volunteers have uncovered almost 20,000 industrial and domestic objects, largely dating to the late Victorian through interwar period. Now, the following lecture will examine the importance of the shipyard, the key vessel type produced at the yard, forged by Niagara's historic Welland canals, and connect you with some of the archaeology which has been uncovered to date. Importantly, I hope that through this presentation, it will reconnect you with the importance of maritime archaeology, and provide you with one example of how water has literally shaped human history in this province. Shipyards form an important component of the maritime cultural landscape as distinct locations in which communities of skilled artisans directly participated and interacted in the world system. They were the locations where novel ideas and the tribe traditions coexisted while interacting with local social and economic forces and trends. The development of shipbuilding in Canada peaked during the first half of the 19th century to meet the needs of an expanding British empire. While the majority of the Atlantic trades were supported by shipbuilders in Quebec and the maritime provinces, the development of canal systems within the Great Lakes, the enabling access to key staple markets placed a tremendous demand on tonnage. The establishment of shipyards was critical to enabling export of high volume, low value bulk cargoes on the Great Lakes Atlantic route. Furthermore, of course, the need for these shipyards to design ships that were able to navigate both canals and the challenging lake environment was central to economic development. The increased opportunities with the opening of the Welland Canal encouraged a rapid growth industry along the shoreline of the Great Lakes. With clear benefits to both Canadian and American businesses, it enabled development of port towns and harbors and pressed the need for skilled tradesmen and laborers, thereby encouraging immigration. Maritime industry increased rapidly and so did services to support the increased populations. At the heart of industrialization along the canals was shipbuilding. Shipyards sprang up along the banks of the canals, producing ships designed either to engage in the canal trades or that were fit out for the Atlantic trades. Of the two dozen shipyards that were established along the canal, the Shikluna shipyard adjacent to downtown St. Catharines that would become the largest industrial enterprise within the Niagara region. For those who aren't familiar with St. Catharines, we are located in the beautiful Niagara region and the shipyard site is located along Twelve Mile Creek, opposite downtown St. Catharines and Highway 406, um, and below the relatively new multi-span twin deck Burgoyne Bridge. The site of the Shakuna shipyard is today largely an abandoned plot. 
You may have driven down the 406 across the Burgoyne Bridge and took barely a look at this urban tract of land. Save for the couple of city buildings and the tracks of commercial vehicles uh, from dumping on the site, you wouldn't expect that this location was once a thriving shipbuilding business. No less that it holds the remains of one of the ships, a 19th century sailing canaler, which is outlined here, that plied the waters of the Great Lakes for over 30 years. Now, before descending into site history, I'd like to introduce you to Louis Chacuna and provide a brief account of his legacy. Born in Malta in 1808, Louis emigrated to Canada in the 1820s, working in Quebec and New York before settling in the Niagara region. He first developed his skill as a carpenter under his father at Valletta, constructing ships for the Royal Navy during the Napoleonic Wars. After working in the Atlantic trades for a short time, he took jobs at shipyards, uh, building sailing and steamships, and later boats for the Erie Canal. He then served as an apprentice to a Youngstown, New York shipbuilder, where he was trained in drafting before receiving an invitation by local businessmen uh, Henry Middleberger and William Hamilton Merritt to set up his own shipyard at St. Catharines in 1838. With the passing of Russell Armington in 1837, the property in 12 Mile Creek would become a key location on the first and second Welland Canal, positioning 30-year-old Louis to situate his skill and enterprise and support shipping uh, and trade it over the next 40 years. An innovative and industrious businessman, Captain Shakuna was a shipbuilder, a ship owner, a city councillor, philanthropist, and as importantly, a citizen of St. Catharines. Credited with building over a hundred ships and infusing $200 million into the Canadian economy. Certainly we, we see his credit, of course, um, as not only for his demand for skill, which led to a workforce of up to 60 men. And at the yard's height between 1846 and 1877, he was launching between five and seven ships per year. Junius, uh, otherwise known as Seymour Phillips, uh, wrote the following quote in 1856, celebrating Shakuna's contributions to the town. Shakuna would go on uh, for the next 24 additional years to be further recognized for his contributions to shipbuilding. Um, and of course, his historical importance, not only to St. Catharines, but to Canada's economic development. Human occupation of the site begins with indigenous settlement across the peninsula. And although no artifacts have been located during our investigations, the Iroquois Trail across the property, providing access for fishing and hunting along 12 Mile Creek, and also later ag agricultural developments. Its settler history begins with John Hayner and George Adams, who would be granted the land, which was used for grazing and livestock. With the construction of the first Welland Canal between 1824 and 1829, the property was then purchased by shipbuilder Russell Armington in 1828 until his death in 1837. The Hayward Whiskey Distillery was also in operation during this time. Louis Chacuna then won the bid for the yard and went on to both build and repair ships until his death in 1880. Louis's son, Joseph, would continue in shipbuilding and repair until 1890, with the last ship launched from the shipyard in 1885. The, certainly by 1891, um, the property was then leased to the St. Catharines Bask and Bosk and, uh, Box and Basket Making Manufactory, uh, which produced containers um, for the agricultural trade, but then who, who abandoned the site for a final time in 1901. Our 20th century timeline indicates a period of demolition of yard buildings, refuse disposal, and some new developments, including the 1915 Burgoyne Bridge. The archeology span confirms that the filling of the ship basin occurred in the early 1930s, shortly after the family sold the property to the city of St. Catharines. The site was used for military drills prior to the Second World War and became the home of the local, of the local sea cadets. New city infrastructure, including a maintenance building and a fire training tower were added between the 1950s and 1970s. The site continues to serve as a snow dump 
which also means further layers of modern refuse. With the new Burgoyne Bridge development in 2014, commercial excavation for the bridge footings revealed a significant amount of cultural material. It was the impact on the construction that led me to resume my work uh, on, the Shikuna, on Shikuna and to seek funding from SHRC, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, to enable the excavation of this nationally significant site. To set the stage for the shipyard and the ships built, we first need to examine Twelve Mile Creek and the first and second Welland Canal. The Welland Canal was forged out of natural waterways, such as the Twelve Mile Creek, its mouth located at Port Dalhousie, and its waters sheltered by the Niagara Escarpment. While its proximity to new urban areas would provide accessibility to materials and resources, in purchasing the property to start uh, their business, a shipbuilder would need to acquire a piece of ground large enough along the waterfront and at about the right height above the water so that the ship, when ready for launching, would slide down into the way, um, slide down the launching ways uh, by its own weight. It was here that the keel block would be set, not too far from an adequate depth of water to float the vessel when the ship left the ways. Um, certainly, um, uh, ship, shipyards also required an ample supply of building materials from yard buildings, uh, fence lines, walkways, and of course, for shipbuilding, the most critical supply line was timber. Being located on a key shipping route was critical to providing a ready supply of hardwoods such as white oak, red oak, softwoods such as white pine, tamarack, lark, and spruce. This map uh, illustrates the location of the property shortly before Shakuna took ownership in 1837. While the property on 12 Mile Creek was an ideal, was ideal in location, uh, to extend the yard's capabilities and the number of ships that could be uh, in fact launched, uh, Shakuna would shape the property to fit his needs by excavating a large L-shaped basin um, from the existing diversion along the creek. This would allow building locations for five canal-sized vessels, some launching directly into the creek, while others were launched into the basin, that, thus maximizing space while also uh, maximizing profits. The opening of the first Welland Canal in 1829, connecting Lakes Erie and Ontario, provided a navigable waterway to enable shipping and trade, while also providing a source of water power through the development of hydraulic raceways. The canal would support a range of new industries, industries and among those uh, early businesses was shipbuilding to support development of a new fleet that could best serve the growing region. Shipbuilders such as Russell Armington, who first settled the property that would become the Shakuna shipyard, faced inherent problems with operations along the first canal and difficulties determining what type of vessel would best fit the forge landscape. Shipbuilders would refine their construction methods to, to, to take advantage of lock space, developing what may be considered as a proto Welland canal ship. Although vessels employed full canal dimensions, uh, vessels employing full canal dimensions were rare, the development of a ship type was certainly uh, underway by this point. Seen here is the archaeological excavation of Lock 24, which took place in 1987. Illustrating the wooden locks which enabled these early ships to climb the Niagara Escarpment to circumvent Niagara Falls. The wooden locks were, however, problematic, as were the number and limitations of the lock dimensions. Their quick decay, coupled with the expansion of trade, would lead to the design of the second Welland Canal. The limitations of the first Welland Canal would lead to the construction of the second Welland Canal with its larger stone locks while reducing the number of locks for transit. Initiatives to construct vessels that would maximize carriage through the Second Welland Canal was apparent as early as 1844. Louis Shakuna would become a principal designer of this new class of vessels built to fully maximize canal dimensions. The ships were intended to carry their cargoes between the upper lakes, uh, upper lake ports, uh, either Kingston uh, or Oswego for transshipment overseas. This large and noble looking class of vessels and uh, sailing vessels and propellers was born to meet the requirements of this forged waterway. By the mid 18, uh, 1950s, uh, sorry, 1850s, moy, uh, 
full well in, uh, full size welling canal propellers um, and and sailing vessels um, would dominate the carriage of sta uh, staple markets such as wheat and timber, and became much more than just another form of ship. They constituted an industry that would characterize bulk trade and commerce for the next 30 years. While Shakluna built several types of watercraft from tugs and steamships, work boats, and even a yacht that won several awards, most of the ships launched at the shipyard were welling canalers. The sailing canalers and propeller canalers were constructed at a dozen Great Lakes shipyards designed to fit through locks of the second welling canal. They were the most prolific vessel type on the lakes during the during the mid-19th century and unfortunately resulting in the most casualties, many of the ships now popular dive sites around the Great Lakes. One of these casualties was Sligo, built in 1860 at the Shakuna shipyard uh, as the Barkentine Prince of Wales. Her purpose was to serve both oceanic and Great Lakes trade, carrying wheat and timber from the Upper Lakes to Kingston for export overseas while also carrying a cargo of quill oil, quill oil um, from Sarnia to Liverpool in 1862. She was rebuilt and re-rigged as a schooner by Le Chaclune in 1874 and renamed Sligo for employment exclusively in the Great Lakes, carrying the first shipment of wheat from Port William, which is now Port Arthur, uh, and supplies to support the construction of the Canadian Pacific Railway. She was a workhorse, uh, an 18 wheeler basically of her day. Uh, the Sligo was then cut down in 1908 at the John Simpson shipyard in Oakville, which uh, for use as a tow barge um, when the cost of sailing and manning ships outweighed the cost of operating steam tugs. Many of the old second canalers would end their lives under tow, um, basically pushed to their limits um, based by both weather and of course uh, overloading employed carrying cargoes of limestone um, from quarries in the Bay of Quinty to Toronto and Hamilton for the construction of Highway 2, the Sligo's career ended in 1918 when she found her during a rainstorm at Humber Bay near Toronto. Between 1997 and 2001, I led underwater archaeological surveys of the site that resulted in the production of this photo mosaic. Located at a depth of 70 feet, this bird's eye view of the wreck illustrates her boxy construction and the massive cargo compartments from bow, which, which is at the far left, to stern at the far right. The ship's lengthy career is a credit to a shipbuilder, and even today she continues to contribute to economic, de economic development of the Great Lakes region as a local dive site. Having examined the product of the shipyard, let's now examine the Shukuna shipbuilding complex. By the mid 19th century, the ship, or the site was ex uh, extensive, covering uh, over two acres and supporting a range of manufacturing capabilities. Our fieldwork to date has concentrated on two areas of the complex. Um, the building where the ship's boats were constructed, with smaller boats such as yawls um, that would serve as the vessel's launch uh, when at anchor or in the case of abandoning ship. And also the laborers houses, which, were, is lo which are located south of the main shipbuilding uh, complex, where some of the men at the shipyard lived with their families. In addressing these two areas, I wanted to explore both the shipbuilding context, but also the human experience beyond the shipyard. We often certainly look at um, artifacts um, without context uh, to their wider um, cultural impacts. And this is an opportunity for us to connect certainly um, those humans that actually shaped the property. Um, and certainly uh, looking at connecting um, these communities, you know, we look at the ship carpenters who shaped the frames and planks, the ship joiner who undertook the cabin work, the caulkers that drove the oakum to make the ship watertight, the mast makers who shaped the spars, yards, and booms, and the ship riggers who spliced the rope and set the shrouds and stays. Now we have a long way to go to fully reveal uh, the shipyard's legacy, but our work to date has identified um, a, a range of features and finds that do characterize this important shipbuilding site. 
By the 1860s, the shipyard was a bustle of activity. The sound of caulking mallets and steamships powering along the canals with a sea of masts which sprouted from the landscape. The following 1864 photo documents a considerable business for the shipyard by this time. But seen here under construction, the Welland Railroad Steam Propellers Enterprise and Perseverance located behind the boathouse, which is the two-story rectangular building at the far left. Uh, the schooner Clyde and the tug Samson are to the right beside the ship basin. And note the dark shadowy feature um, on the deck of the tug, which is Louis and his foreman. At the center stage is the barkentine Valletta, which was launched in December of 1863 and is seen here fitting out for her first trip to Chicago. Sadly, Chicago is also where she would meet her end during the Great Fire of 1871. I referred to a ship that lies within the shipyard earlier in this presentation. Um, the Sir Charles Napier was launched from the Abbey Brothers shipyard in Port Robinson, located south of Lock 34 on the second Welland Canal. Having previously worked at the Shaklina shipyard in the 1840s, the brothers were asked to build a ship on the same hull lines as the St. Andrew, an earlier Shaklina built vessel. The ship would be rigged at the Shaklina shipyard uh, and uh, ultimately it would return to the yard uh, for repairs and a significant rebuild during its career. In 1871, the brigantine was lengthened and re-rigged as a schooner and put back into service. After a long career in the bulk trades, she would return to the Shaklina shipyard for one last time in the mid 1880s, where it's likely the cost of repair were too significant and she was abandoned to decay in the ship basin. The ship can be seen in this early 18, 1930s photograph um, of the site. And the excavation certainly of the sailing canal would provide a remarkable opportunity for the public to experience what generally only underwater archaeologists and sport divers um, often see, a Great Lakes ship wreck <laughs> without the needs of donning scuba gear. The construction of a dry dock enabled, that enabled a vessel to be floated into a watertight basin, the water pumped out, leaving ships supported on blocks were critical to shipyards for building or repairing large vessels. With the opening of the second Welland Canal, Shaklina received a contract from the Welland Canal Company to construct a dry dock, which he later purchased and expanded to a double dry dock. Uh, a significant part of Shaklina's business involved ship maintenance, um, repairs, and significant rebuilds that amounted to approximately 50% uh, of that business. This was, in fact, the first stone built dry dock on the Great Lakes. And this summer, we will uh, complete our preliminary assessment of the site in preparation for survey and text, uh, test excavations in 2024. The project has afforded opportunities to develop an archaeological field school and provide opportunities for local volunteers to participate in field and lab work. Our students and volunteers are central to the project and the work would not have been possible without them. The hardworking team continue, uh, contributed to excavating and screening and mobilizing the equipment each day, doing so in hot and humid conditions, but with enthusiasm for the work and collegiality with their teammates. While many other, uh, many other volunteers and students were tasked with uh, managing and processing finds at our lab on campus. Importantly, our students and volunteers have helped to manage our open day events, which have allowed us to share the initial results from each archaeological field season. We welcomed over 600 people to the site during our open day events. Through our walking tours and tents, we were able to connect the history and archaeology while providing more personal experience. We had an immense, we had immense interest beyond what uh, that we, we could accommodate and hopefully in the future we can increase our capacity to enable additional uh, public archaeology events. In the meantime, we continue to host our social uh, sites on Facebook and Instagram, where we share posts about the site's history and archaeology. As well, our volunteers will be co-creating displays of our work at Brock, and we're also mounting several other outreach events uh, to share the work over the summer and into the autumn. 
Now, moving, progressing with the actual excavation, um, the following map provides overlays for known historic buildings on site. It also identifies each of our six meter by three meter excavation areas, OA1, 2, and 3 in blue. We undertook very limited period of excavation at OA2, the ship's basin, with plans to return when we mobilized for excavations of the 1854 ship. The bulk of our work has focused on the, bulk, uh, on the boathouse at OA3 and the laborers' dwellings at OA1. Using a combination of hand and mechanical excavation, we've ultimately reached a maximum depth of 80 centimeters at OA1 and a maximum depth of between 80 and 110 centimeters at OA3. And to provide some scope on the archaeological campaign, I've digested the project in numbers between 2019 and 2022. And as you can see, we have managed an impressive increase in fines despite our crew numbers. Breaking that down further, um, over 1,200 field hours and 1,200 lab hours were completed in 2019, um, compared with 900 field hours and over 2,000 lab hours in 2022. Archaeology is very labor intensive, and, but of course the benefits in working through uh, the process from field to lab has been critical to our understanding and interpretation. Over half of the artifact catalog consists of glass and ceramic objects, uh, while slag, metal, bone, and other objects make up the balance of the collection. Well, for classification purposes, over half the collection is household and food and beverage items, while well, about 21% of the collection comprises architectural materials and hardware relating to the built structures at each of these locations. When we first uncovered OA3 in 2019, we marveled at the three post structures um, in that were laid out in perfect symmetry that were exposed thanks to the careful initial back uh, hoe work, um, which we, and you know, ultimately that indicated in turn that we we're on the right track. What we didn't anticipate, however, was um, the 1920s fill layer, um, which we would need to excavate in order to, of course, get to the shipbuilding layers. So while a number of the features uh, and vines at this location do coincide with the later period of shipbuilding, the majority of our finds in this fill context explore the post-1885 period of St. Catharines. OA3 has uncovered a range of materials dating from the period between 18, uh, 1870 and 1930. The collection of late Victorian, Edwardian, and interwar period materials contributes to our understanding of the men, women, and children who settled along 12 Mile Creek. Their experiences in Niagara's historic environment recorded in the objects and activity areas within the soils that we uncover. Evidence which provides important clues about their day-to-day -day lives and speaks to the global networks of materials bought, used, and discarded by these communities. From pharmaceutical bottles, leather shoes, bottle and window pane glass, a range of ceramic patterns uh, and arch architectural materials, ironwork, leather strapping, buttons, glass marbles, and even the head of a golf club. Although less time has been devoted to OA1, the finds uncovered uh, included some of the earliest ceramics, glass, and architectural materials, such as mortar, nails, and plaster. As far as features, this too is a mixed layer, made slightly more difficult by the sloping location and the inevitable runoff from said slope. Um, we have uncovered a section of building framework and we're hoping that deeper or adjacent uh, investigations may lead to intact foundations and other cultural remains relating to the workers who lived at the site. An important aspect of this work in tracing material assemblages to St. Catherine is, uh, is actually tracing those material assemblages to St. Catharines. Um, the connections which of, of not only the travels of the artifacts uh, to the shipyard, but also the, of course those voyages of the ships that were built there and transporting commodities. Take for example, this chamber pot produced at the Cobridge Pottery, uh, which was operated by Henry Alcock uh, in Stoke-on-Trent between 1861 and 1910. The pot would have been packed for export and initially uh, shipped aboard a small canal vessel um, north along the, north, uh, the Trent Mersey Canal to the port of Liverpool. 
when the pot when the pot reached Liverpool, um, those it would have been shipped then aboard uh, ocean going ships to places such as Montreal, where they would then be transshipped aboard a Welland uh, propeller canaler. Ships such as the Shakuna built America um, carry significant quantities of earthenware across the lakes during uh, her career and contributing to the material assemblage at the Shakuna site. And no doubt, many other historic sites across the lakes prior to the advance of indoor plumbing. The 2019 uh, and 2022 ceramic assemblage included ironware, stoneware, uh, earthenware, ranging in dates from the 1830s to the 1920s. The majority was from English potters, although we had a smaller assemblage of more utilitarian stoneware uh, that was produced here in North America. The porcelain in the collection has been traced to Czechoslovakia, Austria, and Germany, with another two examples produced in Japan. Illustrating the global trade in ceramics during the 19th and early 20th century, and the importance of supply chains that produced and distributed uh, a range of patterns and motif uh, to grace the dinner tables of St. Catherineans. A young lady preparing for a night out in St. Catharines and perhaps hoping to channel a little Daisy Buchanan might invest in a new product um, that she read about in an Eaton's catalog to capture her Jay Gatsby. To ensure she had the perfect scent to capture that suitor, um, she might have bought April Showers by Cherami. This lovely one ounce uh, bottle of perfume has an art deco style um, boss pattern and a label would have been affixed to the center. While its contents were contained using a screw top um, that was once fit into a tiny bake light cap. Other perfumes containers uh, located on site included a fragment of a Pinot's perfumery uh, bottle from France and also a small bottle from the California Perfume Company, both dating to the, between the 1900 to 1920s period. This partially corroded metal object is the pocket edition of the Gillette safety razor, which were the original three piece style uh, razors. And they were, there were numerous styles. The one shown um, here is the shell design. Gillette was channeling the trends for Victorian styled materials with ornate design work. They worked with the American button company to produce these razor sets to create this ornate casting work on their handles. The cases had a variety of different designs and were available in gold, silver, and gunmetal. Importantly, this draws on the increasing mobilities um, of a male workforce who may require a quick shave while traveling. Finally, a small milk glass container located in 2019 and embossed with mentholatum, which was originally fitted with a metal lid and paper label. This product was used to treat headaches, muscular rheumatism, cuts, bruises, and burns, and was likely produced in the Ford Erie location, a subsidiary of the U.S. Uh, company founded in 1889 that produced a range of healthcare products. Our initial dating of this container suggests a post 1906 manufacture. Also from our 2019 field season, the sole of a youth uh, or ladies lace-up boot manufactured by Goodyear circa 1898. Who knew Goodyear produced shoes prior to their entry into the automobile sector? Uh, this well-preserved boot, as well as other leather goods, such as bridalry, um, it illustrates the potential for uncovering other key organic materials. For example, ships to dig. Another fascinating object uh, was this tube of Rexall shaving cream. The 2019 and 2022 project team found a wide range of toiletries and hygiene products on site, either crushed or rolled up, a method we still use today to get the last drop out of a product and illustrating how archaeology not only reveals physical artifacts, but also past human action, ingenuity and frugalness, behaviors we can all relate to today. One of the exciting discoveries at OA3 in 2022 was the concentration of darker features alongside the contours of ash. We decided to test this area by excavating a sondage, which is essentially a trench within a trench. Combined with the large quantity of slag, a byproduct of metalworking, it suggests that we may have uncovered a component of the blacksmith's forge at the shipyard, which produced ironwork for shipbuilding beginning in the 1870s and through the mid-1880s. 
Note the chimneys behind and to the right of the boathouse in the above lithograph, um, which seems to confirm with our findings. The use of ironwork was central to technological advancement at the shipyard. You know, with the opening of the Third Welling Canal in 1881, a new and larger class of canals would support the bulk trades. To enable the increased cargo capacity, iron was crucial to provide strength and stability in shipbuilding. Now, although wooden shipbuilding remained at the core of Shaklunas enterprise, Joseph had begun to increase ironwork with Louis passing. His efforts culminating in the construction of the composite-built uh, Sir Leonard Tilly, launched in 1884. The 769-ton, 168-foot vessel was iron-framed and wood-planked. Despite increased technological innovations, the launch of the WB Hall in 1885 marked the end of shipbuilding at the site after 58 years of operations. The slag will be sent off for archaeometallurgical analysis this spring, and combined with analysis of soil samples and quantifying and qualifying finds from this area of excavation, I'm hopeful that we may uncover a fascinating aspect of the site's metalworking history. Results which could expand our knowledge about ironsmithing in St. Catharines and its contribution to the late 19th century Great Lakes marine industry. So in conclusion, I want to share some of the plans on what comes next for the project and our program of archaeological work. Our maritime history is so often hidden from the public's view. While the nature of the maritime element means much of this is hidden due to the physical location of these sites, lying submerged in our lakes and rivers. To add to these challenges, maritime archaeologists in this province are limited in telling these watery histories due to the current Ministry of Labour uh, regulations, which has impacted both the practice of underwater archaeology and the training of students in Ontario. But there is a silver lining for the Niagara region. We're fortunate to live in, an, an, in this area whose waterways have served Indigenous peoples for millennia, and its settler histories from as early as the 1670s are defined by its maritime significance. Niagara served as the location of, for the earliest lighthouse on the Great Lakes in 1804, while our historic well and canals would become a central factor in economic development. This would spur a range of maritime developments and technology to support trade. In particular, the shipyards and dry docks that sprang up along the canal and produced more ships than any other place within Upper Canada. We intend to continue our work at the shipyard, subject to receiving our next research grant, and of course, our excavation of the ship that lies within the ship basin. Beyond the main Chakuna site, his double dry dock, which lies underneath the segment of the Mara Trail, and as mentioned, second oldest dry dock in the Great Lakes, and the first to be built out of stone. Additionally, the oldest dry dock in the Great Lakes uh, may be the 1831 dry dock built by uh, Merritt and Donaldson, and also located along 12 Mile Creek. In addition to our buried ship, there are over 12 shipwrecks located around Port de Luzi, the majority of which are third Welland canalers. We will undertake some initial survey reconnaissance next summer towards identifying these ships and documenting their canaler legacies. Finally, an inventory of the historic locks is critical to managing and interpreting the intact sections of our historic well and canal, remnants which are spread across the Niagara region. We intend to test a pilot project on how best to record and monitor these sites, and in turn, hopefully, increase heritage tourism to visit and explore the canal corridor. As we prepare to celebrate the well and canal bicentennial in 2029, we are reminded of the importance of our waterways and the role they played in shaping human history across our province. As discussed at the start of this talk, water has been central to the development of Ontario as a route of transportation, a source of water power, and critically to sustaining life. It continues to enable these sectors today and highlights why now more than ever, we should re-engage with our water histories to pre appreciate our maritime past and reimagine these sites for the future. If you would like to learn more about the project, um, certainly please feel free to visit our social sites on Facebook and Instagram. Um, we will be relaunching our uh, website in September. But if you have any questions in the meantime, uh, don't hesitate to reach me uh, by email at shipyard at brocku.ca. Thank you.
<laughs> Thank you very much. That was really fascinating. Um, I, I have a question, um, which you touched on, I think, a little bit at the end there, but I'm going to see if anybody else has any questions for. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? I can relate. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, I can. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> now you're I'll, breaking I'll up a little. I'll repeat it for what she's asking. Okay. Okay. Um, for the uh, workers at the shipyard. So they're wondering if we have archival sources about the uh, workers at the shipyard. So we we have some source information, and a lot of that comes from using census records and city directories to start to reconnect with uh, individual histories um, uh, for those who of course lived and, and worked at the shipyard for of course varying period, periods of time. Uh, you know, of course, part of telling the story of these artifacts is telling their story. And you know, we we you know we're we're starting to understand the sort of economic viability, shall we say, of a lot of these workers um, based on the types of materials that we're finding. So, for example, one of the artifacts I didn't mention was. Uh, that we found a serving platter and uh, for oysters um, up at OA1 at the at the laborers' houses, which again sort of speaks to some of the finer objects um, that may have been used um, by a family of a of perhaps a sort of a higher level um, uh, role within the shipyard. Um, but then again, we found, of course, you know, within the same context, uh, various uh, stoneware and much more heavily uh, used um, ironware. Um, so again, we, you know, we, we do, we, we shape as historical archaeologists our site based on that, a lot of, a lot of good historical information that we have at our disposal. The, the images that I've shared, the maps that we have are, it's quite remarkable for a single archaeological site. Um, you know, we can really tell a story and visualize a lot of these uh, histories and and about the and 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 therefore shed light on um, the workers that that uh, existed there. We've also, uh, I should mention, had a lot of uh, families reach out to us. Um, those not only from the Shakuna family, but also those who had worked uh, or served at the Shakuna shipyard which is really fascinating, you know, is to connect family histories um, to the work that we're doing and to really contribute a chapter in their own genealogical histories about the role of these um, individuals and their impacts clearly on the Canadian uh, early Canadian shipbuilding industry. Thank you, that was really good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I actually have, uh, this actually is before, does anybody else have any questions? Okay. Um, my first then is gonna be, I, since I know you're doing this, or at least some of this work as a field school, um, mm -hmm. what kinds of projects, like student projects, are are, are coming out of this work? Like, what kind Ooh. of opportunities are they having? Great. Yeah, hey, lots lots of great questions tonight. Um, so uh, the one of the great outcomes of this project was that I then, of course, devised this field school program, and um, you know, through that we we developed uh, a, a couple of uh, oh, what uh, what are they called? Um, uh, short sort of, of uh, stories about different aspects of the shipyard that were products of the students' coursework, um, you know, during their, uh, during the field school. Um, we've, we transitioned during COVID uh, to an online course, which has then in turn led to a number of different outcomes uh, pro projects where students have been using the artifacts, to uh, tell stories. In fact, I've just received a quantity of poster presentations from our recent intake of students. Um, each of those posters talking about uh, a different element regarding landscapes, uh, documents, uh, or uh, artifacts relating to the Shakuna shipyard. Um, so again, all of these projects, um, you know, providing an opportunity to engage students with the archeology, span um, with both the historic documents and um, the actual physical archeology, span but also to lend an, uh, introduce them to public archeology span and the importance of public archeology span and, and for them to share what they've learned um, with the public. 
So certainly through the courses, you know, that has led to a number of student opportunities. Um, we've uh, involved students in a number of side projects. Also, uh, we are undertaking a uh, transcription of some, something called the Welland Canal Registers. And these are a remarkable source on the history of the Welland Canals, um, documenting all the ships that transited through um, Lock 3 of the Welland Canal, which is adjacent basically to the Shaklina shipyard, really telling the story of not only the ships, but of the cargoes they carried. Um, and of course, the people, uh, usually the masters are listed um, uh, alongside also where the ship was coming from and where the ship was going to. So again, really engaging students with some of the materials we use as historical archaeologists to tell the story of not only maritime history, but of course, of uh, the commodities that helped to shape uh, Niagara's history. Well, that's also fantastic. And of course, we here are the components of the public archaeology program. So that's really exciting for us to hear as well. Um, Wonderful. <laughs> um, we, I've got one last question for you. Sure. You did touch on uh, a little bit when you're talking about your future research. Um, but what other kinds of, or are there other kinds of like landscape elements that are visible in the city today that sort of reflect its past history as this big shipbuilding industry site? Oh, absolutely. I mean, and, um, well, the Shaklina shipyard was only one of about a dozen shipyards along the canals. And, you know, there's, there's just such a wealth of resources in Niagara. Um, you know, Niagara's had a sort of mixed legacy, shall we say, in development. And unfortunately, in the 1960s, a lot of the historic elements were raised um, to make way for the construction of Highway 406. But despite that, and even despite the modifications or the, the changes um, that, that resulted from the uh, repositioning of the third Welling Canal, there are still fragments of these uh, original shipyards and dry docks around the Niagara region at Port de Luzi and also Port Robinson. And I mentioned the Abbey brothers and of course their construction of the Sir Charles Napier. Um, you know, again, we have other shipyards to dig to tell the story of shipbuilding across the peninsula. Um, you know, we, Niagara uh, Harbor and, Dro and Dock Company also at Niagara on the Lake is another um, uh, opportunity to sort of look at uh, some of the larger steamships that were being launched, including Shukuna, who, who not only built at uh, local to St. Catharines, but also built uh, in Niagara on the Lake for a number of years. So yeah, um, you know, uh, the locks, docks, uh, shipyards and shipwrecks, I mean, there is just such an immense amount of maritime history that has really um, to date been largely unknown um, or unrecognized. I think it sometimes takes a maritime archeologist sort of to see and connect those different stories, you know, to tell those soggy legacies and to share um, not only, of course, of our terrestrial uh, maritime landscapes, but of course, connecting it with uh, those that, you know, of course, lie now on the bottom of our lakes. That's excellent. Thank you. Um, so just um, then before we wrap up, is there anything else that you would like to add? No, I just um, that again, uh, for those uh, who are interested and if, if, you know, if there are those who are interested in uh, joining us, we won't be returning to uh, run the field school this year, but in 2024, we will return to excavation. And again, we do um, encourage the public uh, to join us or to participate in other ways. Um, you know, part of, of, doing archaeology, I think it's about sharing archaeology and sharing the experience of archaeology. And we have a, a, a real opportunity to do that um, with this site. You know, it's so centrally located. And, you know, often we've had volunteers who delighted in the fact that it was archaeology in their own backyard. And uh, while I appreciate uh, with, of course, its um, distance to London, Ontario, um, it is a little uh, further away. Um, again, we always encourage those who would like to join us um, to, to do so and to learn about these um, sites of great importance to our history. Well, that's fantastic. And we'll make sure to share all of the information, that, the contact information um, that you shared with us when we upload the video as well, so that other people will have an opportunity to, to reach out if they're interested. So thank you Wonderful. again.
Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, it's been a pleasure to have you for our, our, in, our small, intimate audience here. Um, but we're, hopefully, um, we will be able to share this widely as well on our social media and find the audience that it deserves. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, the VIP audience were very, very uh, welcoming. So thank you very much for attending. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you again and have a good night. You too. Take care, Heather. Bye.